Colossians chapter 2, verses 1 through 6. Let's read those verses right now to start with. For I want you to know how great a struggle I have on your behalf and for those who are in Laodicea and for all those who have not personally seen my face, that their hearts may be encouraged, having been knit together in love and attaining to all the wealth that comes from the full assurance of understanding, resulting in a true knowledge of God's mystery, <clears throat> that is Christ himself, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I say this so that no one will delude you with persuasive argument. For even though I am absent in body, nevertheless I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good discipline and the stability of your faith in Christ. <clears throat> Therefore, as you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. Lord, this is your word, and we pray that you would minister your word to our hearts and change us and make us more like you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you for your word. Amen. So in chapter 1, Paul really hit on Jesus Christ being the preeminent one. Colossians 1, verse 15, he said, said this about Jesus. He said, He is the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by Him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through Him and for Him. He is before all things, and in Him, in him all things hold together. In other words, He is nothing less than the Creator God. That is Jesus. He is the only one who has restored us to fellowship with the Father, with God. It is Him. It says in Colossians 1, 21 and 22, And although you were formerly alienated and hostile in mind, engaged in evil deeds, yet He has now reconciled you in His fleshly body through death in order to present you before Him holy and blameless and beyond reproach. He's done that for you and I. He saved us. He's forgiven us. He's made us holy. He can present us before the Father. Holy, beyond reproach. <coughs> Nobody can say, look what Pastor Jim did. God says, I don't remember that. I don't know nothing about that. He saved us eternally. We know Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And I believe most of us in this room have received the Lord. We are saved eternally. I pray that every one of you has done that. If not, come and see me afterwards. We can pray and get that settled in your hearts. So Paul is committed to get this message out to the world. He's, he's so committed to it that in Colossians 1, 28, 29, the last verses we looked at last week, he said, We proclaim him, that's Jesus, admonishing every man and teaching every man with all wisdom so that we may present every man complete in Christ. For this purpose also I labor, striving according to his power which mightily works within me. It was his life. It's what he did. It should be our lives. What we do. Proclaiming Jesus in our lives. Showing the world who he is. Whatever that means in your life and however God made you and however that works in your life. We're all different. One piece of person shares the Lord this way, another person shares the Lord this way. You know, we can't say, well, you're not doing it my way. People used to try to get me to go and stand on a picket line. I didn't want to stand on a picket line. I really would tell somebody about Jesus and pray with them and receive Jesus rather than stand on a picket line. That was, but praise God, you go for it. But the problem is, they always said, you should be there to your pastor. No, I shouldn't. God didn't tell me to. You did. And they're not going because you told me. So how, you know, because I, I, I mean, you know, when I share these things with you, I'm not saying that you have to be like me or, or someone else or someone that goes door to door and knocks on the doors and, you know, you just walk down the road and you get a megaphone. Jesus loves you, you know. You don't, have, you don't have to do that unless God tells you to. Then do it. You see, there's so many, so much opposition to the gospel of Jesus Christ in the world. There's so many voices out there telling you so many different things. And you and I have the answer. We can share that with people. So, that brings us to chapter 2 of Colossians. In the first verse there, 
Paul says, For I want you to know how great a struggle I have on your behalf, and for those who are at Laodicea, and for all those who have not personally seen my face. That's what I love about Paul. Paul struggles. He, he, he has struggles and conflicts because he loves people. And, that's, that's, and so he has problems and troubles and trials and tribulations because he loves people. And he wants them to know the Lord, and so it's caused him much problems in his life. Even And some of them he's never even met. He still loves them and wants to share with them. See, Paul saw the big story, the overall picture. Even though these people he hadn't even met, he knew that God was working, like we're saying today. I know God is working even though I can't see him working. He's working. And he's working all over the world. And Paul knew that. He saw the big picture. Why would people get up and move from their country and go to another country to share Jesus unless they believe God was working and moving there? And they go and do that because of that. Because they love people. Different cultures, different lands far away. Because God loves people everywhere. God just doesn't love people in Belize. He loves the people everywhere. And so Paul, he's so concerned for the people, he would go through all kinds of trials in his life so they could know Jesus. I mean, he got beat up so many times. I mean, left for dead. I mean, the guy really got suffered so the people would know Jesus. Now, one thing that Paul did is he always put everybody first before him. Way beyond his comfort. Even his safety. And God knew, I mean, Paul knew that God would give them a new heart. That he would transform their heart. A heart that did not know him to a heart that would turn to the Lord. And he, you know what? The Lord does that for you and I. He gives you a new heart. You know, he says this. I love what he says in Ezekiel. Ezekiel 36, 26, and 27. He says, Moreover, God speaking, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will be careful to observe my ordinances. So he says he will do that. Well, how do you, how do you get that? I mean, how do you get a new heart? A heart transplant. A spiritual heart transplant. You just ask. You ask Him. Because He wants to do it. He wants to change you. He wants to bless you. So you ask. And then believe and receive that He does it when you ask. Another thing that, that we need to do, you know, we, when, once you're born again and you're, you're wanting to share the Lord with people, you need to also have on the armor of God, which we look at in Ephesians 6. The armor of God. We need to put on the armor of God. So that we get out there, we're ready for battle. We're ready for what comes at us. No, you know, no soldiers. Soldiers don't go out there, you know, with just a water bottle. They they got their their guns and their shields and their, all their swords and all their stuff, right? So put on the full armor of God. And as Paul did, and as Paul knew, one of the things is this: the battle is won in prayer. The battle is won on our knees. Prayer is where, it, where it's won. 1 Thessalonians 5, 17. Rejoice always and pray without ceasing. Just pray without ceasing. Continually pray. All the time pray. And everything give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. So Paul has this concern for these people that he had not even met yet in Colossae. So in verse 2 he says, after he says, they have not personally seen my face, that their hearts may be encouraged, having been knit together in love and attaining to all the wealth that comes from the full assurance of understanding, resulting in a true knowledge of God, God's mystery, that is Christ himself. So Paul is praying for them that they would be spiritually encouraged, encouraged in their hearts. So you can have all of these things, and you can know all of these things in your mind. But it needs to go from your mind into your heart. And he says when you do that, 
that your heart would be encouraged, having been knit together in love. Agape love. By being put together in love. Loving brothers and sisters in Christ. An agape love. Agape love is an unconditional love. You don't love them just because they do stuff for you. And they, you know, they like you. You unconditionally like, like Jesus loved us. That even while we were yet sinners, he went to the cross and died for us. When we were his enemy, he still died for us. That's unconditional love. There's nothing we did to deserve that love. He just loves us, no matter what. He loves those in the world that don't even like him. He loves everyone. Unconditional love. And that kind of a love knits you and I together. It brings us together. And when that happens, it says, having been knit together in love and attaining to all the wealth that comes from the full assurance of understanding resulting in true knowledge of God's mystery, that is Christ himself. So he knits us together in this love, and then we get this full understanding of, what, of the wealth and the inheritance of Christ. We'll have an understanding of that and what that means. We'll understand God's mystery. What is God's mystery? Christ in you. Jesus Christ in you. That's God's mystery. But Jesus went to the cross and shed his blood, died and rose from the dead, comes and lives in you. That's a mystery. It was a mystery. It's not any longer. We know it. Colossians 1.27 says, To whom God willed to make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. There it is. Christ in you, the hope of glory. What does that mean? That means peace with God. Peace with God in your hearts and in your lives. Also means that you will have His help and His guidance in this life because He will live in you. He will take care of you. So verse 3 goes on to say, In whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. In Jesus, all wisdom and knowledge are there. He's got it all. All of it. And for you and I, as we love one another, as we, we serve the Lord, we lay down our life before Him, He gives us that understanding of true knowledge. What is really true. What is really right and what is real. That's in this world what is really right and what is really true. Because so many people are deceived in so many different ways. And he'll give you that wisdom and that understanding. Those are treasures wrapped in Jesus Christ, wrapped up in Him, in you. And He will reveal those things to you. The understanding of wisdom. What is the understanding of wisdom? It's the wise application of putting that, those truths in your life. The things that you hear, the things that you learn, the understanding that you get, applying them in your life. Life, just not just hearing them, but applying them. Let them sink into your heart and applying them in your life. So as we surrender to Him, He guides us, He leads us in perfect wisdom. And then with that, you'll have an eternal perspective. You know, it's good to focus your things on, e on eternal things. You, don't, you, know, you don't want to forget about everything in this world, but to be eternally minded, understanding that a lot of things happen down here for reasons, for God's purposes, especially in our life. There's a purpose for those things. There's a purpose for everything. As I told Nervy years and years ago, everything is spiritual. Everything is spiritual. There's something going on with everything. You know, when we don't have that wisdom, when we, we don't think we do, we, we want it. And then we say, well, how do we get it? Well, another thing we ask. You know, in James chapter 1, verse 5 through 8, he tells us, he says, but if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God. 
who gives to all gener generously and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But he must ask in faith, without any doubting. For the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For that man ought not to expect that he will receive anything from the Lord, being a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. So if you want wisdom, you ask the Lord for it, and you believe that he's going to give it to you in faith. You don't ask, well, Lord, I'm asking for wisdom, but I really don't think you're going to give it to me. I, I, I'm probably not going to get it. No, Lord, I'm asking for wisdom, and I believe you're giving it to me. It's, it's the same thing for me. When I go to pray for someone to be healed, when I pray for them to be healed, I believe they're going to be healed. I know they're going to be healed. It's just a matter of God's timing when that happens. So you pray believing. Not doubting. Believing. And guess what? He's willing to give it to you. He wants to give it to you. I mean, come on. How many of you don't want wisdom? I mean, I would think that everybody would want wisdom. I, I think. I don't know. Maybe you've never thought of it before. Well, think about it. Go home. Say, Lord, Jesus, I want your wisdom in my life. And I believe you're going to give it to me. And it's done. And then the next time something comes up, and, and all of a sudden you have the answer of what to do and where to go, you go, wow. Yeah, I couldn't have thought of that. That must have been in the Lord. It happens. Ask. Don't just sit here and listen to me blab. Take God's word and put it in your life. Isn't that a song, Anna? Take God's word and put it in your life. One of the kids' songs. Probably should sing for the adults. Good enough. God's promises. Promise. Take God's promises. Bro. Well, we can put, exchange it with wisdom. You see, you and I have everything we need for this life and our walk with Jesus Christ in Him. We have everything we need. It's just a matter of acknowledging it and walking in it. Colossians 2.10. You know, we're not going to get there today, but next week or the following week, when the ladies come back, it says that in Him you have been made complete. And He is the head over all rule and authority. Now you see, all these things are tied together with the second verse here, which says, Let our hearts be encouraged, having been knit together in love, and then attaining you know, the understanding and the wisdom. It, it all come, comes together. And, and so you, you can start by loving one another, by being knit together, by being put together by the Holy Spirit. That's the way it works. All the riches and understanding and true knowledge will be yours. This is the way it works. Being together fellowshipping together, not being a lone Christian. It doesn't work. The lone Christian thing, that does not work. You're not, you can't, if you're out there alone, it, it's just not going to work. That's not knit together in love. It's coming together and being with one another and fellowshipping with one another and hanging out together and going to church together and fellowship together. That's when these things happen. If you, if you alienate yourself and back off from that, you're, you're in trouble. Spiritually, you're in trouble. You probably don't even, wouldn't even know it until one day you wake up. How did I get here? Well, verse 4 of Colossians chapter 2. He says, I say this so that no one will delude you with persuasive argument. You see all those voices out there trying to deceive you. You know, if we're doing these things here in the, in, in the first two verses, they're not going to deceive us. We're going to have God's wisdom. We'll have His understanding. You know, at that time, they had the Judaizers there that came in after people received the Lord. And they said, yes, well, you received Jesus, but you there's something else to it. Now you need to obey all the commandments, and you need to get circumcised. And they came along and added to the gospel of Jesus Christ. The Judaizers. And then there was the Gnostics, you know, the intellectuals. Said, yes, that's all good, but it's much deeper than that. You need to know some more first before you can really attain those things. And then and leading people astray. And we have those voices today in many, many different places. You go into most of the colleges in the United States, 
you know, those intellectual, those professors that are so smart, you know, and they all the book, all the books they've read, and, and here, here's these young people come in, 18, 19 years old, and wow, this professor, he knows so much, and they believe anything he says, and he goes and tells them the thing about Jesus is real, you know, and starts to tell them all these different things. Hear from slime, or you know, whatever they do. There's all those voices out there. Colossians 2.8 See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception according to the tradition of men, according to the elementary principles of the world rather than according to Christ. So Paul says, watch out for that stuff. Be in the Word. Be in fellowship. Be knitted in love together in Christ with one another. And then verse 5, For even though I am absent in my body, nevertheless, I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good discipline and the stability of your faith in Christ. Hang in there, guys, he's saying. Hupa you know, the Greek word there. Hang in there. Be solid in the Lord. Read the Bible. Study the Bible. The, the, the Word of God has been under attack for over 2,000 years. It is still here. It has not been disproven. The facts are the facts. There's a lot of theories against it, but the facts, the facts, and science proves it all the time. The facts it has not been disproven. I've been studying the Bible now for 41 years, and I believe it. I believe it with my whole heart. There's no way you can convince me any other way. And there's so much stuff out there. So much stuff. Read your word. And then verse 6 and 7 of Colossians chapter 2. Therefore, as you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in Him, having been firmly rooted and now being built up in Him and established in your faith, just as you were instructed in overflowing with gratitude. So in this part right here, this section where we're stopping today, with walk in Him. Walk in the Lord. Walk in Christ. You're firm, firmly rooted in Him. And, and be thankful that the Lord is in your life. And one of the things that we do here at Calvary Chapel to follow and obey the Lord and to walk with Him is we like once a month as a body of believers to receive the elements of communion, you know, the Lord's table, when the Lord uh, at the Last Supper, when He took the bread, He broke it, He prayed. He said, this is my body, which is broken for you when you do it. Take it in remembrance of me. And He, and he took the cup and He said, this is my represents my blood. This is my blood which was shed on the cross for you for the forgiveness of sin. <coughs> and so, we like to remember that. He said, and when you do it, you, you proclaim my death until I come back. Now, one of the things that I, I also like to do is, I like for us to, to search our hearts, see if there's any sin in your life, anything that would separate you from the Lord, and just confess it to Him. Be made right before Him. The Bible does say not to take, to, don't take it in an unworthy manner. Well, in an unworthy manner, I believe it's just taking it because you do it. You take it because you take it because everybody's taking it. You take it because you need to take it because we are sinners and His blood forgave us, wiped our sin away. And we're saying, yes, Lord, I am a sinner and I receive your forgiveness again. So let him search your heart and be made right before him this morning. And it doesn't matter what denomination, if you're visiting here, you know, it doesn't matter. The Bible doesn't say you have to go to this church or that church. It just says, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, it's for you. And I know some, some denominations say you can't take it with another, another denomination, but that is not biblical, okay? As a brother or sister in Christ, we are all welcome at the Lord's table. So, as every Christian pass the bread, why don't you guys... Hold on to it. We'll partake of it together. We're going to sing this song, Search My Heart.
God bless you. Hang out. Fellowship will visit. God bless your week this week. Walk with Jesus.